morning, Lizzie. How are you? <laughs> Great, thank you. You? <laughs> yeah, really good. I just lost you there with the sound. That was weird. Um, but uh, you're back with us now, so that's good. So, um, how's things going? Fantastic. Uh, back at work, some sense of normality. So, uh, it feels quite strange saying that, actually. <laughs> the new normal. <laughs> What is um, <laughs> yeah, it's great to be back at work, um, and you know, and doing what I do, what I love the most. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's um, yeah, it's the same for a lot of people, especially you know, business owners out there as well that you know are truly really just wanting to get back into you know the real passion for what they do. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same as what you just said there. So, um, so is it Elizabeth, Lizzie, Izzy? What do you want me to uh, <laughs> call you today? <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm glad you've asked me that because not many people know why. Um, so, Elizabeth's my real name. Lizzie's my nickname. And Izzy is just my kind of cover um, Facebook name. Um, so when, because obviously we're having a professional platform, um, people call me Elizabeth because it, it sounds professional or more so than Lizzie Orange Photography. Um, but then once they know me, they call me Lizzie. Um, so Izzy is just a, um, if somebody was looking for me on a social media platform, um, if they don't know me, they won't know to look for Izzy. So it's just trying to separate my, my personal life from my business life. Because it is very difficult when you think, well, I had a client contact me yesterday. What platform did they contact me on? And is it my work platform or my, my personal platform? So just trying to make, you know, like teachers do where the students can't find them. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm Izzy K on Facebook. Um, but yeah, start out as Elizabeth and then once people know me, it's Lizzie. Lizzie. Cool. So I'm going to call you Lizzie because uh, I feel that <laughs> I've, uh, I've known you for some time now, which we'll, I'm, I'm sure we can get onto in a little bit of, of where we kind of met each other originally. Um, <laughs> but I want to dive right in with the first question, um, really, which is if you weren't doing what you are right now, as in photography, you know, what is it that you would be doing? You know what? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Um, hopefully something creative. Um, creativity is something that, you know, I crave. Um, I like where I have to have input. Um, but in terms of, you know, job number two possibilities, I'm really not sure. Really not sure. Well, that's, um, I think I've, that's when you found your true passion, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, and it's very difficult to find, um, you know, assistant jobs or jobs in a photography studio because they're very few and far between, which is one of the reasons that I actually set up my own company because trying to do what I wanted to do for somebody else um, was incredibly hard, hence, you know, why I started my own business up. Absolutely great. No, and it's, it is that, isn't it? It's when, when you feel that you've, you're restrained almost when you're working for other people. Mm -hmm. and you can't have your own creative side mm -hmm. you know so that's you know great move really on on that and it's been clear in your success as you've gone along Thank that you. you know your creativity has really shone and, and worked in what you've done so what, what kind of child were you um child though hmm. um a creative child I was always coloring painting drawing um, we've got countless books and things of, you know, being a few years old. <laughs> this is you, mum. This is you, dad. <laughs> um, and I've always been animal uh, based as well. So um, the amount of cuddly toys outweighs my dolls in my attic by about tenfold. So, um, yeah, pretty much as I am as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> a bit creative, loves animals. Um, yeah, a very, very happy childhood. So you just found like you, your authentic self just at a, a much younger age than what most people do. Yeah, so I've never been one for you know pretty dresses or whatever, but give me give me some colours and, and a dog, um, I'll be really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So just kind of moving on to to your journey, like you said, you've had this massive creative background, and you know it's what you did as a child right through to what it is that you're you know still doing now. You you know your love and passion. You know how did you start out on that kind of initial journey? Obviously, you know you've built this very successful company, you know as you are now. But how did you start, and was it always easy, or has there been you know challenging times? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think everybody thinks their own to success is like this. 
Do you know what I mean? You start at the bottom and now we're here. <laughs> Um, and it's it's never like that for anybody. Um, I left school and didn't want to go and do A levels. Um, I wanted to do another challenge, so I went to college. Um, went to go and do an art and design B tech, which is still a really broad subject. We were doing things like um, um, ceramics, you know, three D drawing, uh, life drawing. We're doing, you know, um, quite you know literacy um, literature in intense subjects as well. Um, because I didn't know what I wanted to do and I thought that was still something I could take several avenues from um, in later life. Um, and photography actually was, was on that course and that's where I really kind of started to enjoy it. Um, but it was all film based then, obviously where you've got your 35 mil or your 120, you develop the film yourself, you, you print them yourself in a dark room. And I think because that was a hands-on thing, um, I really enjoyed that. Um, so when I, when I got to the end of college, I thought, well, the only thing I'm still really enjoying is photography. And um, although I never thought I'd actually use it as a degree, I just thought having a degree says something about your character. You know, you, you, you've given it three years, you know, you, you've got a degree to put on your CV to go, you know, your piece of paper. And um, I loved it, but I never actually thought I'd have a job at the end of my degree that was photography based, which is quite ironic now saying that. Um, <laughs> I entered the world of work as a marketing agent and um, for a huge company that sold uh, oil filters, fuel filters um, internationally. And although I really loved people there, I didn't wake up in the morning and think, yes, another day of going to that office, talking the same talk at the same time and you know, the same phone calls, the same people, it was very repetitive. And, you know, there, there was a gentleman there, um, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me mentioning his name, called John Newitt. And John said to me, um, Elizabeth, if photography is what you really want to do, just do it. He said, you're young enough. So at this time, I would have been 20, 21. And he said, you've got no major responsibilities, no kids to feed, no mortgage to pay. If you do it and it goes wrong, so what? You're young enough, it, it, you know, it, it shouldn't affect you. You know give it a go and if it works it works if it doesn't then you go and get yourself another job and honestly I can't thank him enough because that was the reality slap that I needed of going do you know what John I think you're right because give it 10 years I wouldn't have been brave enough to do it when you have a mortgage you have a family um and that for me was just like the light bulb <laughs> sure. um and then, and then from there, um, obviously, it's, it's grown and grown and grown. And I'm so thankful to have such an amazing client base. And, um, you know, I can't wait to get into work now. And I can't wait to see what the future holds. And it, it's great to kind of go, yes, I'll do that job. No, I won't do that job. Or, you know, this is the idea. Why don't we do this? And, you know, to be involved in all the organisations like Mansfield National 2020, um, where hopefully I am making a difference and I am meeting other people like me and helping them on their journey. So it's not just about me and my hat. Um, I like the fact that it's, it's very people based and no two days are the same for me as well, which is something that I'm so thankful for. Yeah, that's it. And it's, you know, it's keeping it fresh every day, like you say, that keeps the excitement going almost yeah. as well. But just yeah. on that, I mean, you've obviously mentioned that, that bit of advice that John, you know, gave you there. You know, is that the same advice that you would give, you know, say to like a, a school leader now who maybe doesn't have, you know, a, a, a definitive direction in the kind of um, typical uh, journey mm -hmm. of where they think they should be going as opposed to maybe a hidden passion that they've got? Um, I always think that schools should tell you about the third option. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fourth option, you either leave, leave school and go to A-levels, um, you leave school and go to college, you leave school and enter the world of work, but they don't really talk about going self-employed. Um, it's one of these things that if you're not self-employed, you're petrified of it. Um, and although um, I have the most amazing support system for my family and friends, um, none of my immediate family or friends, when I first started, owned their own business. So um, my, my support platform comes from the networking events and things like that. So it's one of these things that it's not scary, but every time you find a hurdle, you just ask the right questions, make a few cheeky phone calls. You know, people are generally quite happy to help as long as you're not rude. Um, you know, I've had numerous cups of teas with people that have got, already got their proper job, got a mortgage and want to go self-employed. And it's about making... Um, 
calculated risks at the right time. Does that make sense? If, you, if, if you've got this massive house, massive mortgage, four kids to feed, you can't jump from one ship to another without the, the ladder in the middle. But the ladder in the middle might be two years in the making, so you can comfortably do it. Um, sure. Being self-employed is amazing. There's, you know, it has anything, up, up days and down days, obviously <laughs> that's what's going on at the minute. But um, I'm very thankful to have a job that I, I actually really enjoy. And I do hope that kind of comes across today. Sure. No, that's that's great. And and obviously kind of touching on that, has COVID been one of the biggest challenges for you and your business to date? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we always tell you, don't we, when you grow up, you know, put a third of your paycheck away, put a third of it for a rainy day just in case. And you always kind of go, yeah, we will. <laughs> um, even in a business plan, it's very hard to plan for something that you don't think will happen. Um, so we started to hear about COVID about what January, December ish. Um, yeah. But this time last year, if you'd have said to me, you know, you'd have had to shut your doors for three months, um, you know, the whole world w- would stop. You'd be like, no, you no, just you know, stop it's an pulling the. <laughs> uh, you know, how can you do that? Yeah. So. Um, when when lockdown started to happen, so it was what what kind of March time, um, I had probably four days where the phone was just ringing off the hook, and every time one phone call ended, another one started. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows, but I, I also do weddings. So I do about twenty five to thirty weddings a year on my own. That's my maximum capacity that I'll accept. Um, I've had sixteen weddings this year postponed for next year. So not only now have I got all my 2021 couples, I've now got all my 2020 couples into 2021. So next year for me is going to be ridiculous. But I felt very, um, I was on autopilot. And I think taking those phone calls was, you know, obviously my my couples were distraught to be postponing and you're not sure if it's the right thing or if they're doing it out of caution or, you know, for me it was just, uh, you know, thanks for letting me know, don't panic, we'll sort it, you know, I, I know as much information as you do, so I'm just going off what Boris is saying as well, um, and I just had this massive piece of paper in my diaries and a big red pen, going right, they've cancelled, they've cancelled, they've cancelled, um, because some people were getting married next week, next month, um, and as I say, although it's not a very nice experience to postpone your wedding day, uh, all I've been saying to my wedding couples is, just think about the experience you'd have this year and the experience you'd have next year. You do want to get married with just 30 people where you can't sing, you can't hug and kiss them, you can't go dancing with them because you can't have a reception. You know, wait, you know, and have the celebration you want next year. So it's been very, it's been difficult, but I think it took a while for it to sink in for me because initially I was just in there, yeah, it's fine, we'll sort it, you know, don't be upset, not a problem. Um, and as well, all my photo shoots were probably about four months cancelled as well. So yeah, within those four days, um, not good. But you know, big picture, everything will be fine. Sure. So twenty twenty one, you're obviously going to be busy, and a lot of people don't realise it's not just about taking the photos, is it? It's the behind no. the scenes that yeah. takes all the time up. You know the editing side and, and obviously things that I don't understand as well behind the scenes that you know you do um but and, and that kind of justifies obviously you know because people almost see it don't they in, in kind of photography they go wow that's really expensive but actually you look at the value and the time that you have to put in to perfect that I worked it out once Mark and it worked out per hour about three pounds sixty wow so I know people will think, yes, wedding photographers, you must be minted. The answer is absolutely not. I do this job because I love it, not because I want to buy a Ferrari with cash. <laughs> sure. Because you won't have the time to drive it anyway. <laughs> you won't be able to drive it either. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, so next year you'll have a lot of editing to do around the additional weddings now on, on yeah. top of um, next year's. Um, so. Obviously, you met Sean as well. So since um, you started with Elizabeth Orange Photography, you've met Sean along the way. How did you two meet? Uh, On a night out, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Um, On a night out. 
uh, we, we actually fell out the night I met him. Uh, we had a little tiffy and um, yeah, started talking the day after on social media um, and we've never actually fallen out since. And in eight days, on the 9th of July, it'll be five years. Incredible. Five years. So very happy. And he's a wonderful man. Not that I'd ever tell him. So I hope he doesn't watch this video. But, uh, yeah. I'll make sure um, it gets to him. <laughs> that bit. <laughs> no, um, you know, he, he's amazing. And, uh, you know, I tell him in our own special way, you know, every now and again. But uh, very thankful to have met him. And, uh, and I'm very excited for what the future may hold for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So realising, uh, just going back on to, to the COVID time and, and losing that amount of business so quickly and mm. almost then panicking of what do I do next? Yeah. You know, what was your gut instinct and you know, what, what did you do at that point? Uh, my, my gut instinct was just, I think like quite a lot of self-employed people is you look at your outgoings and you think, right, what, what can I cancel or what can I pause? What can I postpone? Obviously, some people are doing um, deferred payments for three months. Um, so all those kind of things have helped. Um, but for me, um, I actually got a job stacking shelves at my local Asda store. Um, so that for me was just... Uh, a rent payer basically um so i don't have a mortgage to pay at the minute but i still have bills i had you know a quarter of a year's rent to find within a few weeks and i just kind of thought i'm not about to sit on my bum and watch my business disappear over the next few months because it can't open you know i've worked really i have worked very very hard to get where i am today and i'm not the type of person to kind of you know bow down and watch it disappear so for me, an income is an income. It doesn't matter where it is, what it is. I'd have gone litter picking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, not afraid to roll my sleeves off and, and, and you know, do some hard work at all. <laughs> yeah, no, and that, that, you know, that's credit to you as, as well for that because I think the thing is we're in a culture almost that there's an expectation where if, if things are in times like COVID as the prime example at the moment, people almost feel that, you know, there should always be help other than me having to help myself. Mm. So I think by you stepping out there and saying, actually, you know, I'll just, I'll find another way to cover what I need to is, yeah. as I say, it's just credit to yourself. So just brilliant work on that. And what, you know, how did you find it, you know, working back, you know, in a place where you've got a boss <laughs> compared to being your own boss? And a proper job. Yeah. <laughs> job um <laughs> you know what they're the having a boss element to it i actually don't mind you know i'm in an environment where i know you know my opinion is not the one that matters um and i was just going in getting my work done and coming back but it, it was actually nights it was it wasn't daytime shifts it was all nights um obviously replenishing the stock on the shelves so it's quite solo work, obviously, once they know what you're doing, it's like, right, this is your department, here's your eight hours, go. Yeah. Um, the work itself, I take my hat off to people that do it all day, every day, because it's very, very difficult work. Um, you up and down a ladder, the boxes are really heavy. Um, you know, I was coming back with cuts up my hands where the cardboard had got me. Um, very, very difficult work. So if you do that all day, every day, I take my hat off to you. Um, but the thing that I really struggled with actually was was nights, um, the sleeping in the daytime element to it. it. It wasn't so much the work. I wasn't slowly getting used to it. Um, and obviously, once you, you find your feet with it, you know, you kind of just switch off and do the job. But it was the sleeping in the daytime and going to work at night um, that I found very difficult. Obviously, not having not done a night shift before. It's not easy um, and obviously it was at a time where it was really really bright in the day and obviously because I don't do nights I don't have blackout blinds I don't have blackout curtains obviously you've got everybody in the garden um, so, so it's noises you're not used to when you're trying to sleep and I, I think after four weeks my mum and dad just took one look at me and they went no more <laughs> you're shattered you know you don't look very good you know you've made enough you know to cover your rent you know no more and I think the, the feeling was mutual um and it is also very difficult to keep your distance in an environment like that as well 
So you, people would come in, replenish your shelves. Um, I think it was 10 p.m. to about 2 or 3 a.m. And then from 3 to 6 in the morning is when your um, online shoppers come. So if you do, you know, home delivery um, over the internet, they, they actually come and pick it off the shop floor before the shop opens, which is fine. But you, you're tripling the amount of people you've got in the shop. And it becomes very difficult then. And obviously this was in the height of the pandemic when you're meant to keep your distance. Um, and I think obviously, you know, people are put, literally putting their lives at risk to, to go and get other people food. And I know that sounds really kind of quite honest to say, but there was a few times when I just thought, it's, you know, they're far too close. <laughs> <laughs> far too close. So um, as you say, I, I'm really, really glad I did it. It was an amazing kind of comfort blanket for me that, you know, I had some income coming in to keep my business safe. But, you know, long term, I think four weeks for me. So anybody that does that Monday, Friday, nine till five, or not nine till five, <laughs> five till nine, <laughs> sure. they're incredible. They're incredible. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I say just credit to you again. Um, did you almost feel like you needed the, the green light from your mum and dad to say it's OK to say no more as well? Did you, you, feel you, needed that? you know, when you have that extreme tired feeling and you're like, oh, oh my eyes look like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> One of those. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, um, they did say, you know, they were very proud of me for not sitting at home and, you know, complaining about how bad the world is. Um, you know, I had gone out and I had made an effort and I was one of the lucky people. I'd got people messaging me a couple of times a day, Liz, can you get me a job at Asda? Like, I'm the recruitment lady for it. Like, I'm really sorry, but like, you still need to ring the store. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I've taken from that experience is, you know, I did put it online, but I didn't put it online for people to judge me. I put it online to go, look, look, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> um, and actually all of the positive comments um, and just the, the overall, overall, you know, warm feeling I got from that, people going, do you know what, Liz, good on you, um, was incredible, absolutely incredible. So, um, no, it's been a very, it's been a great experience. Don't get me wrong, I, I was happy to... Uh, hang me um, box cutting knife up after four weeks but um, I am glad that I did it. Good, good and uh, you know it's, it's all about the experience isn't it as, as well if you can learn something from it just take one thing away mm -hmm. it's been a great thing. Um, so nice. Was it when you left Asda that you then saw a post on Facebook or was it whilst you were still at Asda? Whilst I was still at Asda while well, she was still there. So yeah. tell us a little bit about the post that you saw <laughs> <laughs> and so, how that's um, almost changed everything that you've done for the past, you know, two months now. <laughs> so um, obviously with everything that, that's going off in the world, um, one of the things that people are looking for is, is uniform wash bags. Um, so if you work in an environment where, you know, you are a, a potential of catching COVID-19, one of the things your employer would ask you to do is actually take your uniform off um, as your shift finishes, put on fresh clothing um, before you leave, because obviously then there's no kind of cross-contamination of you going out, sitting in your car, you know, going home, having a cup of tea, you know, before you know it's on your settee, then you found... So what they're telling you to do is actually to take your uniform off, put it in a separate bag, and then the minute you get home, you put that in the wash, um, including the bag. So it's about kind of, um, you know, trying to slow the contamination possibilities. Um, and I, I kept seeing it quite a lot, actually. And I thought, you know what? I've got some time on my hands. <laughs> Um, because with those at Asda, obviously it was very, they ask you what shifts you want. So I, I could have, I think I did five shifts back to back one, one week and it nearly killed me. Um, so I was picking up, you know, anywhere between two to four a week, um, you know, towards the, the fourth week. And um, I just thought, do you know what? I'll have a go. So we had a, I call it a family conference. We're all sat around the dinner table going, right, th this is a picture of what I want to make. <laughs> this is the fabric I found in the attic. And um, can we have a go? So between the three of us, that's me, mum and dad, um, they've been so patient with me. It's been incredible because I'm actually not a sewer. I think one of the misconceptions 
over the last few weeks is that I already know how to use a sewing machine. Nope. Learn <laughs> from scratch. Yeah. Um, I probably could have worked my way around threading it up, but you know, it would have been wrong. Um, I could probably sew in a straight line, but that I couldn't do corners. I wouldn't know. I, I just wouldn't know. So yeah, it, it was definitely a family effort. And um, from from complete scratch, yeah, to, to where you are with it. So obviously, you've not always done sewing. So was it very much? just giving it a go, watching a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> I, I didn't even do that much, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> no. Just dived in. <laughs> so um, I, I had some fabric left over from, um, from trying to make bunting for the studio. And um, what I thought is, you know, I've had this fabric, I've been saving it for a special occasion, and I'm like, let, let's, just, let's just use it. So I managed to make probably eight uniform wash bags, and I posted them on my personal platform, and they went like that. But I'd still got loads of messages and comments of people going, you know, have you got any more? Can you make any more? Liz, these are great. Can I buy one? And then I kind of just thought, oh, <laughs> uh, we have an opportunity here. So um, what I actually started doing um, is trying to raise money through public donations. So I was making videos saying, this is what I want to make. And, um, you know, if you could donate me a fiver, that would fund the fabric. And then that fiver would make, I don't know, three uniform wash bags for me to give away to people on the front line. And I had some amazing messages and phone calls of people that I know that I might not have seen for years. Going, Elizabeth, I really want to help people on the front line, but I can't sew and I don't know what to do. Or, you know, can I give you some money to put in the fabric fund? And the answer is obviously absolutely. <laughs> um, so I was, I was literally, once I'd left Asda, um, just getting up sewing, having my lunch sewing, having my dinner sewing, um, having a couple of hours watching TV and going to bed. That that was my lockdown experience. But I actually couldn't sew fast enough than the demand. The demand was that great. Um, and it, I found out it was better for me to rather than make one from start to finish. It was literally like, right, do one stage today. Zoom. Next stage, the day after, you know, the top bit. And um, it, it literally was a production line. Our dining room table we, was just full. and. Um, People were, were ringing up and going, Liz, I, you know, I'm, I'm a radiologist at a hospital. Um, you know, there's, there's eight of us on our team. Is there any chance I could have eight? And the answer is, yes, of course you can. Just give me a few days and I'll, I'll do it. Um, but people were contacting me from uh, Manchester, Sheffield, London, uh, Birmingham. So it's not, it's not just local. So I was actually also doing, um, you know, every other day going to the post office. <laughs> which is fantastic but obviously I was sending all these uniform wash bags and posting it to them for free because I wanted to do something that would help them that are helping us um, you know and it is a time where if you are on the front line I imagine it is quite solitary and it's quite lonely and people were actually like not giving up their family time but they're going right I have a young family and I'm a front line health health worker I'm actually going to move out of my family home to care for other people while the pandemic's there. So how could I say to them, that wash bag's, you know, £4.99, please. It just, it felt right to do it for free. And it felt lovely that there was members of the public, you know, people I know, people I don't know, that were saying, actually, Elizabeth, I'd, I'd love to donate you £10 if that's okay. Because all I was doing is going to a business, um, going to Tracy at Material Girl Fabrics in Sutton, um, so she was operating with her door shut. So I'd never actually met Tracy. <laughs> I'd never worked with her business before, really. I just cold called her one day and said, are you still selling, you know, and do you post them out? Because if you do, I really need to, you know, buy some fabric off you, please. And um, I was I'm literally ringing her twice a week, placing orders for fabric. And, you know, at, at one point, it was just ridiculous. I, I got a stack about that big of wash bags posted them online and they'd gone within an hour. Um, so the demand was there, absolutely. Throughout that kind of process, you know, all of the, you know, the, the assembly line that you've got going on at home, um, mm. and obviously you've got donations coming in from people wanting to, you know, do the five pound, 10 pound, et cetera, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, there's also a business that 
came to you, right? Mm -hmm. And said, actually, we'd like to donate to you. So I don't know yeah. if you want to tell us a little bit about, about Absolutely. That. So the business that I'm um, going to mention is FRV Tailoring, um, run by John and Donna Sentence. Now, that that couple, John and Donna, are actually one of my wedding couples. So I photographed their wedding a few years ago. Um, and although I don't see them every week, which is a shame because they're fantastic, um, John actually messaged me and he said, Elizabeth, if, if you're struggling to find stuff, tell me and I'd love to help. Um, so actually the top of the wash bag I was using ribbon for, um, like six mil ribbon and only tiny, tiny, but it was rarer than hen's teeth. It was getting really difficult to get hold of, even with, you know, the internet at your fingertips. Um, so they actually sponsored me with red cord and I just wanted to hug them down the phone. Um, in fact, I probably did shed a tear when they said that. Um, and the, as well, what they sponsored me for is, um, sponsored me for cotton. Um, I was phoning Tracy and pre-ordering 10 reels of cotton because I was just sewing them that quick. Um, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. And what else they were sponsoring me for is um, elastic. So one of the other things that I've begin, uh, begun to make um, is um, ear protectors. So these are what the ear protectors are. So if you don't know what they are, they sit at the back of your head and rather than having a, um, a PPE mask around your ears, you put it around the, but the button at the back so it'd save your ears from being sore. So this is one of the other items I was giving away to NHS and key workers. Um, but this item is what I've been selling to the public. So once the donation started to slow for the wash bags, um, I've been making these and selling these to the public for three pounds, which is not a lot, but each mask funded the fabric for two uniform wash bags. So although selling them to the public, I wasn't doing it as a business, I was doing it to fund the charity work, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Because kind of eight weeks, nine weeks down the line, the donation started to slow, but I've still got this amazing demand so I just kind of needed to bridge that gap. And I thought, well, fabric face masks are going to be something that we're all going to need for public transport, you know, going to the doctors, going to the hospital. Um, you can reuse them. You can wash them at 60 degrees, which does kill any bugs. Um, uh, it just kind of made sense to me. Um, but I actually ended up uh, raising £600 by doing that. And that was a point where I knew I couldn't sew that. And that's kind of where, you know, the, the next stage has come from, really. That's, it's ju that's just absolutely incredible, you know, um, to have, have raised that. I mean, how, how many, do you know offhand how many items, not necessarily just wash bags, but everything included, you know, how many items that you've actually sewn during that period? So up to today is uh, 986. So uh, by you saying that, you're still going. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as much haste as before, obviously now with my business being able to open from the 15th of June. Um, but, you know, I, I got very close to the thousand pound item mark and I, and I, and I want to push past that. Absolutely. So this is where you've coined the phrase of sew a thousand, raise a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sure so how far are you away from target at the moment of what you were wanting to achieve what you set out to achieve initially um so my my target initially was so a thousand item and raise a thousand pounds so i've only got what 14 more items to make and i've gone over the sewn um target which is amazing so hopefully i'll do that before the end of the week and um in terms of the the money target um i'm very happy to announce that i've actually raised 1600 pounds now wow so you've gone <laughs> way over and above what you what you'd initially set out to do um uh, with less items too so great yeah. <laughs> um that's absolutely incredible um so you've raised all this money um you're doing all this work etc mm -hmm. and how did you go from, you know, right, I've got this money coming in, where am I going to donate it to, to making a decision around it? Because there's so many charities yeah, out so there many. that are all in need of, you know, financial help. Mm -hmm. you know, 
how did you make that decision? Um, so I said very openly when people were donating to the Fabric Kitty kind of phase one, <laughs> the first few weeks in, the minute that I, I don't want to do it or the minute that, you know, there's no demand for it, obviously I'll stop buying fabric, I'll stop buying everything, I'll just give away what I've got and any money left in the pot I would give to a local charity um, or NHS. So, but we've got people like Captain Tom who's done an incredible, you know, challenge for himself. And he's raised, what, 35,000 straight to our NHS, which is amazing. Um, but I kind of knew the NHS would be okay because obviously everybody helps the NHS by paying taxes. Yeah. So I didn't want it to particularly go in their pocket. I wanted it to go to more the people that needed it. Um, other, you know, frontline workers, um, you know, things like that. But starting to have a look around um because this is when i'd only got 600 pounds <laughs> that's still an amazing amount of money to give away to charity um and i thought you know i'm a mansfield lady mansfield based business you know the majority of the people that have either bought masks or donated have been mansfield based let's find something within our community that you know the people of Mansfield you know love and need um, and one of the things that I found was obviously John Eastwood Hospice but upon reading about the hospice I didn't actually realise how heavily they rely on um, you know public donations and fundraising and obviously at the minute that's not going to happen sure. so I, I phoned the hospice over a weekend and I spoke to a doctor um, who just managed to pick up the phone um, and had such an incredible conversation with him and he was so humble like you know I was kind of bi not bigging him up but you know while he'd got time to talk to me let's try and make him smile um, but he, he was lovely so obviously he couldn't answer the questions that I wanted answering at that time so I phoned up again on the Monday and the lady that answered the phone is a lady called Angela. Now Angela is a volunteer journalist so her job usually is going all over the world doing stories writing press um but obviously all of her stories and trips were cancelled so she was a little bit like me you know i don't want to be at home bored i want to to volunteer so she volunteered at the hospice um so, so she was the lady that picked up the phone in the office when i was going there you know hi guys i've got i've got 600 pound for you um and she said elizabeth i really like your story can i run with it so me being me was like, if it puts more money in the charity pot, then, you know, I'd, I'd do anything to support that cause. Um, and that's kind of where the last few weeks have come from. In absolutely, you know, incredible. And like you say, it's, it's not just going back to what you said with Captain Tom. It's not discrediting, you know, absolutely not. You know what he's done and the no. amount of money that he's raised. Um, but perhaps that, that money, you know, could have been better spent or better gifted into local charities that really truly need it that are still a massive support on the front line mm. but the nhs should be covered anyway through taxes etc so I, I personally i completely hear you you know with that um but absolutely incredible that you've you know you've worked with now the john eastwood hospice and you know off the back of that obviously you've met angela who then introduced you um, to get you the introduction onto BBC, right? <laughs> do, you, do, you know, do you want to know something funny? I actually nearly didn't pick the phone call up because I thought it might be somebody selling me PPI. <laughs> <laughs> you only get one of those numbers and you do that, you go, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> So um, I, I was in a you know environment where I could answer it, and you know I could have had a few minutes on the phone, even if it was PPI. Um, and it was actually a trap that I've never heard anybody sound so nice on the phone. <laughs> um, and he knew my name, obviously before I introduced myself, and it kind of twigged quite early. And then he said he was from BBC um, East Midlands. In fact, no, the first phone call, sorry, was BBC Radio Nottingham, which explains why he's so happy on the phone being part of a radio team. Um, Obviously, he'd seen my story on the internet um, he wanted to roll with it and wondered if I would go um, and have an interview to be broadcast on BBC Radio Nottingham within the next few days. So 
course, my answer was yes. <laughs> Say yes now, panic later. Um, <laughs> and it, it was amazing. So I had a good, I don't know, four minute slot on BBC Radio Nottingham um, being interviewed and it was incredible. Um, very nervous though, because obviously that was live. Although you can't see me, um, that was a live feed kind of straight out there, you know, never done anything like that before. <laughs> Um, really fresh sure. which has been fantastic but just before I was about to go on air for the radio my phone went again and I thought it was the radio team um, you know hi Elizabeth it's so and so from, from um, BBC's Midlands and I kind of thought cause I don't watch the news incredibly a lot I kind of thought it was under the same umbrella and she said oh no Elizabeth we're, we're TV <laughs> so you know say yes now panic later um, and within two days of that, um, I was interviewed um, for BBC's Midlands, which has actually been shown, the clip that they've, they've shown has been shown twice, um, once last night and obviously once last week. So, um, but from that, I've obviously had some amazing press and publicity and that's what's helped drive the total from 600 to, you know, 1600. Absolutely incredible. So it's, it's, it's worked being on TV to get that extra. Yeah you know yeah. um you know kind of reach for people and hearing you know the incredible story of of what you've done um as well um obviously we'll come on to sort of sharing how people can maybe you know donate etc as well and i'd like to do that right at the end so it's fresh in people's minds um moving on to a, a subject really that i know that you you quite passionate about talking about uh, in particular um when I, I sort of approached you for for this um and actually i asked you well is it for you or is it for other people and you said it's more for yourself and that's to do with kind of mental health during the time of of covid as as yeah. well yeah. um you know so we you, you know we kind of mentioned sean earlier and you know you've been together five years and incredibly happy together although albeit that you had the tiff on the first evening you know um and you know what a lot of people probably don't know is that you know obviously you don't actually like live together no so you know you were looking at this house together as as well before all covid happened how you know, just explain where you were mentally at that stage and, you know, how, how that then made, you know, kind of you both feel. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, being at an exciting time in your life where you're starting to look for a house and then having the rug pulled from under you. Um, but it's also the same in business sense. I've just got my business where I was happy because um, what one of the other things I've done is I've, I've trained as a newborn photographer. Um, and so being on so many different training days and I, I just managed to find my feet with it. And then obviously it's like, <laughs> gone. <laughs> um, so although, you know, although I am a, uh, you know, a proper woman shape, um, I actually quite like being active, but my active is kind of diary active. Um, you know, appointments, meetings, you know, uh, going to look at new venues, uh, you know, ha having chats with customers, photo shoots, newborns, um, you know, going to see Sean one night, staying at home the other. So my diary is always, I'm always, I'm always busy. And I knew that one of the things, um, that I, you know, speaking selfishly is I, I knew I'd struggle with lockdown because you can't do anything. Um, and I, I don't know if that comes from, you know, your personality or, you know, having your own business is actually, I like to be busy. I like to feel like I've done something that day. I know that sounds, you know, pretty honest to say, but I knew once the novelty had worn off, um, I'd be really uncomfortable and, I, you know, it would affect me. So I did start it selfishly by just wanting to, something to do, something to get up in the morning to do, but, you know, making a positive difference with my time off rather than just sitting on my settee shouting at Boris on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it did start by just trying to find a purpose, you know, a temporary purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, 
although I can't help people on the front line financially, I can't give them all a hug like you want to do. I'm a hugger. This has been really difficult. Um, it was about trying to find, you know, a use for your time and something to keep me mentally stimulated. Um, because, I know, you know, it's very hard to think, right, well, I'll, I'll do a new business plan. I'll do this. I'll do that. But, but when your business isn't open, I, I kind of feel like I'd lost my mojo. Um, that, the, the fire that's normally within of, you know, your passion for it was put on hold because you don't actually know when you can return to work. You know, if somebody had said to me, right, it's going to be 10 weeks and then you can open again like you want to, then you, you have a different mindset, don't you? But because we're obviously we're in such an uncertain time, actually having something that was making a difference for other people that needed it. Um, and some of the comments I've had of people that I've never met have been fantastic. They've, honestly, I've been in tears talking to people going, you know, you know, why are you saying sorry to me? You know, you're, you're the one that, you know, <laughs> that needs all the support that I can give you. Um, and obviously I was using my work platform more than my personal one as well, because obviously my business platform has a greater reach. So um, thank you to my, my clients that have put up with that over the last kind of 12 weeks, um, because it's very different, isn't it? Following somebody for photography, then all of a sudden they're, up, they're on there giving stuff away. Um, you know, so it did start from me just trying to find something to keep me, keep me busy. Um, and it's all kind of grown, grown arms and legs from there, really. But it's been an amazing experience and I, I would never, ever have foreseen it going this big, ever. So what's what's next? Are you going to keep on flowing? <laughs> so um, I have really enjoyed it. Yeah. But you know, I'm under no disillusion that I can continue both with such pace. Now my business is open. Um, it is important to me to return to normality. Obviously, whatever the new normal is. Um, and although I'm still sewing, you know, on an odd evening here and there, um, it's nothing in, in the capacity that it's been in the last kind of, you know, nine, ten weeks because I just can't, I can't sew all day and run a business, um, you know, or one of them's going to suffer really. So um, it, it is important that I, that I do kind of regain my normal, but um, now it is literally just face mask for the public. Uh, the demand for the wash bags is, you know, nearly all but gone, um, which is a good thing because obviously either they've all got one now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no it's very important that we do try and get back to normal so um, I do have the odd you know wash bag or item if somebody messages me really lovely then I will say yes but um, it's it's very hard to run a business anyway um, let alone with all the new COVID-19 restrictions policies procedures um, you know it's, it's very difficult so you normally have all of these tabs open anyway you know got to edit that email them ring these do that do that um, let alone trying to go back and sew 30 items a day you know I, I would just burn I'm afraid so I, I'm just trying to do both of them but yeah I think I'm going to give myself probably another 10, 10 days to 14 days to sew as much as I can raise as much as I can and then I've got to call it quits at some point unfortunately. Sure absolutely and, and within that 14 day period 10 to 40 day period that you're talking yeah. about now yeah. um i said i'd come on to it so how can people still help right now so mm. you know, how do they get in touch with you what's the best way yeah. and um what, what kind of help you know are you still looking for okay um the help really that I'm looking for, obviously with, with the support of FRV tailoring, isn't so much as a material help um, because obviously, you know, thankfully I've had that support and I've been able to, you know, say thank you to them in, ev in every way that I can. Um, I think the only kind of help really going forward is it, it, it's now not about the sewing, it's all about the hospice. Um, and I didn't realise actually how close the hospice was to so many people's hearts. And the more I hear about the hospice, the more I love it. Um, so I haven't had any family in there in palliative care, so I don't know what their care is like. But some of the stories I've heard over the last few weeks, um, Angela, um, the lady who I spoke to when I first you know, phoned them to make contact with them, she, um, she actually told me that if you were on end of life care and it was February and you said, I just wish I could have one last Christmas with my family, um, I'm gonna have goosebumps as I'm telling you this. Um, what they will actually do 
is they'll make Christmas happen. They'll put the tree up, they'll do your full Christmas dinner, they got all your family and friends there, uh, you know, in, in their Christmas attire, they'll sing carols, they will do anything they can to help somebody on end of life care, you know, achieve what they want to achieve before, you know, before their time's up. And um, they are that lovely. So one of the other things as well, as I said to Andrew, is what, what is it like being there when, when you are able to go? Obviously I wasn't in a position where I could go and visit and walk around and go, you know, oh, that's the cafe, that's the gift shop. Um, she said, Elizabeth, it's not a sad place. I go, what do you mean it's not a sad place? It's a place where people go, you know, on end of life. And she's going, no, it, it's incredibly happy. It's incredibly positive. People try and make the most of everything for everybody that's in there because it's not somewhere, you, you, you know, you want to go and be forgotten about. You, you're there and you, you have a lot more care than you can have in a hospital. You have a lot more free reign, you know. They have... They, they have um, I think it was one lady that just wanted to, to hug her horse again. I know that sounds like something, but if you are like me and you're an animal lover and you miss your horse, I think they actually brought the horse into the car park and the lady out the front and, and made that happen for her. And she said everybody was crying and that's not something you could ever do in a hospital. And I think the hospice are just, it's such a personal, um, <laughs> it's, it's such a personal organization. Um, that really heavily, as I say, needs support and donations. Um, I know for a fact that they've had fundraisers this year, they've had to cancel. Um, I was going to like a masquerade ball um, with, you know, my, me, Sean and both sets of our parents. So tickets were bought, outfits were bought, and obviously that can't go ahead. That could have been potentially another couple of hundred quid they could have had, but obviously they can't have now. Um, and it, it's just, you know, places like this will suffer, although they do get some government backing. Um, it, it's, it's not half as much as I actually think they need. Um, you know, they're one of the things that on the list of people to look after during a pandemic, you know, people are still on end of life care, whether they've got COVID-19 or not. Um, and it's just, you know, the, the more I talk to people about raising money for the hospice, the more people, you know, they've had loved ones go in there and they've been amazing with them. And um, I just, I'm so, so thankful that I made the right choice. Yeah, made the right uh, and, it's, and it does sound that way as, as well. Um, you know, so, so with that, so donations are going to be, you know, helpful. What's the best way to donate? How can people get in touch with you? Um, to be fair, anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on any platform, you know, carry a pigeon. Um, but probably the, the best way at the moment is either um, if they want to get in touch with me direct and um, pay by a bank transfer, um, then you know, a hundred percent of that transfer will go straight to the hospice. Or you can pay through um, just giving as well. But obviously, just giving will take a tiny commission off that before they give it to the charity. But Obviously, it's whatever way that would be easiest for people to donate. Um, I have been asking that people haven't been donating in cash, just in case of any cross-contamination of anything. Um, but that, you know, that means you don't have to go to a cash board, you don't have to drive to Mansfield, you don't have to, you know, then I don't have to go to the post office either. If it's just done from one home to another, um, but to be fair, Mark, in, in any platform and in any amount, even if it was £2, you know, I'd be so thankful and I'm sure that the hospice would as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, no, it's absolutely incredible work that that you're doing, and um, you know, I'm I'm so happy as as well that not only as a you know as a, as a business, but you know, as as a friend that we've been back from you know college years as as yeah. well. Just the just watching your journey and the success is absolutely incredible to watch, mm -hmm. and uh, I think everyone's in incredibly proud mm -hmm. of what you've done, um, and what you continue to do as well. Um, so absolutely brilliant work, Lizzie, and thanks again so much for your time uh, coming on Inspire. No, really. I'm very thankful to be given the opportunity, and um, I can't wait to watch your business thrive as well. Can't thanks wait. very much. <laughs> thanks, Lizzie. Take care. Now.